Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Co-op Owned and Operated Processing, Cattle Producers of Washington and the LPCA Plant. I'm Catherine Kwanbeck, Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network Board Member and your host today. And thanks for waiting just a few minutes. We had a couple of technical difficulties there to get sorted out. But I, I think we're up and running now. At NIMPAN, we do webinars on topics related to small-scale meat processing and farmers and ranchers who raise meat for local and other niche markets. If you would like to be on our email list, please sign up at our website, www.nichemeatprocessing.org. You'll see it there on the bottom right-hand side of the slide. And if you have webinar topic suggestions, please email us at nimpan at oregonstate.edu. I'll type that into the chat box here in a few minutes. If you're new to NIMPAN, NIMPAN is a network of processors, farmers and ranchers, universities, public agencies, nonprofit groups, and others. Our mission is to support small and very small meat processors as essential partners in bringing local sustainable meat and poultry to market. NIMPAN is also a part of an extension, an initiative of the National Land Grant University System. A few things before we get started today. There will be time for questions both during and after the presentation. To ask a question, please type it into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. The webinar is being recorded, and we'll post it to our NIMPAN website and our YouTube channel later with the presentation slides. And we have a full agenda today, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. If for some reason your question doesn't get answered, just email us after the webinar, and we'll try to get it answered. All righty, so for today, we're going to talk about livestock producer co-ops and processing. And as many of you know, livestock producer co-ops are often interested in owning and operating their own processing plants. On this webinar, we'll hear the story of one co-op, Cattle Producers of Washington, and their journey to build and operate their own plant, the LPCA plant in Odessa, Washington. We'll learn how they got started, how they financed the plant, and hear about the build-out process. We'll also talk about the LPCA's first few years of operation, successes, challenges, and surprises along the way. Our speaker for this webinar is Sulani Madsen. Sulani is a member of the Kapow Slaughterhouse Committee, which organized the co-op. She served as the founding president of the Kapow Livestock Processors Cooperative Association, the project manager for the Odessa Public Development Authority during the slaughterhouse construction, and is currently the treasurer to the LPCA Board of Directors. Go ahead, Sulani. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and starting on the slides. And a little bit first about the, the Cattle Producers of Washington is not a co-op. It's actually a, a, a policy group that is a, a, sometimes in opposition to and sometimes is on the same side as the Cattlemen's, the Washington Cattlemen's Association. Uh, and it's made up of small livestock producers, all who, all who own, own cattle. So unlike the Cattlemen's Association, it does not have the uh, packing plants uh, as members, and that's its big difference. And it has always wanted a slaughterhouse and thus had a slaughterhouse committee, and uh, which ended up in building the new processing plant in Odessa. So the big frustration was the low cattle prices and being a commodity price taker, which was not a comfortable position for a bunch of independent cusses. Uh, so the solution seemed to be to go ahead and build and own and operate uh, our own or their own um, processing plant. Ranchers were frustrated not getting any prime premium for the quality of their production or for the value of, of their personal story that they put into the plant or put into their product. Um, they wanted opportunities for the next generation to continue on the farm, and uh, one of the things that was was preventing that was a lack of profitability and needing to have additional enterprises on the farm. So the problem was seen as uh, USDA processing, access to USDA processing. And I'm sure, as uh, everybody on this call knows, that if you don't have USDA stamp processing, you can't sell in the retail market. So the Slaughterhouse Committee was looking for ways to solve that problem. Um, so many Washington cattle producers were shipping cattle to Nebraska for processing and shipping back as boxed beef. We had the numbers on that. We knew that the number of slaughter facilities in the U.S. for cattle has dropped precipitously. 
from about 600 to about 170 in just the 20 years from 1980 to 1999. So we've lost 70% of that processing capacity. And that's where we focused our efforts was on uh, addressing that lost infrastructure. And as part of that, we looked at the idea of food sheds, which is something that slow money is interested in, the slow, or slow money and slow food people are interested in, which is really trying to get that kind of regional food infrastructure back into place. And as you can see, there, there aren't any little dots in, uh, in northeast Washington. And in that little dot, there's over 700,000 consumers, and uh, the, the main missing piece seemed to be the small-scale retail processing facilities. And I said seemed to be because one of our lessons learned is that in, in any complex situation, there's always more than one problem to be solved simultaneously. And that's worth writing down and remembering. So we looked at the one problem, but we didn't look at the other problems that needed to be solved at the same time. So we believed the problem was to build a new plant so that local consumers could buy local beef and other quality meat products. We knew that market was there. All studies have, have documented how consumers are value local and regional and uh, knowing the, the story of where their food came from more than any kind of uh, label, including organic. So we went on to build that new plant. Slide needs to move. There we go. And we decided the solution was to do it ourselves. So this is the part where I can explain how, how I became a part of it. I don't have cattle. Um, I joined Kapow as an associate member, and I found them because I was part of the Washington Egg Forestry Leadership Program in 2007-2008. Each participant in the program has to team up with a partner in the class on a project. My partner was Cal Mercer, who was operating a cattle feeding operation, was frustrated at not being able to market his beef at a local restaurant. My husband and I raised meat goats, and we were frustrated at simply not being able to market meat at all because processing was so difficult to arrange. As part of our, our ag forestry project, we connected with Kapow, who was, even in 2007, was looking at this, the slaughterhouse problem. And we, uh, we were researching with them. Uh, ironically, as we looked into how to address the solutions to address the marketing and infrastructure, we set aside the USDA processing issue as too big for us to tackle in the scope of our project, and we focused on the approaching loss of skilled butchers as the baby boomers and their parents continued to retire. Uh, most of the cattle producers we talked to who did have a, a, some route to market that was not through the big packing plants we're doing it on the selling the half, the quarter, the, the eighth, pushing that, pushing that uh, direct sales uh, exemption just as far as they could. So we outlined a plan to create an apprenticeship program anchored in the community college system, and it's still a good idea. And one of our lessons learned is that it really is a good idea. Um, it's been tough to find employees in the skilled crafts. So our niche was to look at meeting consumer demands for traceability. The big industrial plants just can't interrupt their production lines to process animals for a single ranch. Um, traceability makes it possible for responsible producers to receive fair compensation for their good stewardship and gives consumers peace of mind in knowing how their food was raised. And as it turns out, we found that even distributors want to see that traceability so they can assure their customers. We were looking at quality. Uh, building a high-quality food system benefits from a farmer-controlled co-op that will focus on quality processing. Quality is what you demand when your name is on the package. So if it's going to say, if it's going to have the name of uh, Cloverdale Ranch on there and it's my farm, then I want to I know that it's coming out right. And safety, uh, consumer safety, and this was a big selling point to a lot of people as we were going through the investment stage. It's enhanced when workers are not cogs on an assembly line but skilled craftsmen focused on quality working at a human pace. And so the pace of work in the large plants is, uh, is a problem. Um, also in terms of safety, we have one USDA inspector covering, uh, it, it would never be more than 20 head per day, and, and that's at peak capacity, um, and that's a far different level of quality control than when there are two inspectors responsible for several hundred thousand head of e each day at a fast-moving industrial plant. So we have a solid niche. We, we knew what we wanted to do. We, we knew thought we knew where the problem was, uh, but we, you know, we didn't know what to go, where to go next. So 
Uh, I know on this call is uh, Margie Hall from the Lincoln County EDC, and our EDC found a program. The Odessa Public Development Authority offered a site, and Kapow, the, the umbrella organization that was uh, formed the Slaughterhouse Committee, created a business plan with some major help from Whitworth University. So the problem is, the we had it. This came up really quickly. This opportunity knocked, and we answered. But the we had 30 days to write a fully developed business plan in order to give the the Odessa Public Development Authority and 30 days to put together the application and meet the grant deadline. That's a very quick turnaround. Uh, we made a pitch to the to a Whitworth University MBA class where teams of students needed real projects to work on, and we had a good team of students that worked on the project. So what follows uh, for the next few slides are slides from that business plan presentation that we made to the, to the Community Economic Revitalization Board, that gets uh, abbreviated as CURB, to the CURB meeting on St. Patrick's Day of 2011 to convince them to loan us the $1.2 million that they had in their kitty with five years deferred payments at 0% interest. It's a, it's a very attractive offer. So I'm going to go through those slides not just in... Uh, order of what happened. This is what we said, and I'll tell you what the rest of the story was. So we, ranchers do raise high quality animals and want above standard services in order to demand premium, premium price, pricing, and we were right about that. Um, our, our project at the time was to build a 5,400 square foot facility. We ended up building a 7,021 square foot facility. Our purpose when we said we wanted to meet the needs of the ranchers and the needs of the consumers, we left out the middleman. It's very easy to think that, um, you know, well, we're just going to cut out the middleman and, and then the producer is going to get all the profit. Well, it turns out that the middleman actually has some tasks that have to be done, and if there isn't a middleman doing them, somebody else has to. So that's one of our lessons learned from this. It wasn't just about the plant. We looked at the location. Um, the location we were looking at at the time, the Odessa PDA actually operates on two sites, and we were originally planning on their site that is closer to Spokane, uh, co-located with another company that is uh, providing a composting service and looking to provide energy from the process. And there would have been some advantages to being co-located. However, some problems came up with that original site uh, later, and we ended up changing sites. So this is just giving you a sense of how you, you know where you're going to start out, but you have to be prepared for ending up in a different place. Um, we, we were able to success to change sites, but it has some other ramifications. Uh, one of them is that the second site is not as closely linked to I-90, which creates some, some issues in terms of transportation. The fourth one is actually the one that we, we probably needed to have spent a little more time on, we had a plan that creates 15 skilled jobs. We didn't ask ourselves, where do those 15 skilled employees come from? And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a question that we should have asked. So we had our marketing plan. Um, our, as you see on the slide, our market, target market was focused on the ranchers that we were going to serve, which is correct, because we're providing a processing service to ranchers. Um, what our marketing plan did not dig into was what's those ranchers' marketing plan to their consumers. And so we didn't dig far enough on that piece because, again, we're focused doing this, this business plan in a very short time. We're focused on the, the physical facilities and what it takes to operate it, but we're not looking at the whole um, ecosystem that it's operating within. So this slide is from that presentation, and it's about modular food systems was a, another new startup. So we have a new startup partnering with a second startup. And that's a red flag that we can all see in hindsight. Um, and those were, these were really good reasons why we selected modular food systems as the way we were going to build the plant. Uh, modular food systems would have used uh, repurposed shipping containers, refrigerated shipping containers, which are well insulated, very sturdy, um, would have allowed some, uh, some methods of uh, being able to start up with a small facility and expand over time, maybe provide a little flexibility in that way. That was the, that was the concept. 
um, one of the issues with that is we ran into a problem. This, so these are things we were looking for. We were looking for a small footprint. We were looking for efficiency. We were excited by the idea to bring in a new technology and really make the Odessa plant uh, a model for the country and, and being able to use the same method to build small-scale facilities in a lot of places. So we had a lot of, we kind of added this extra goal on top of our original goal, which was to build a plant so we could get processing. And we added on that we were going to transform small-scale processing by showing how we could do it with this modular system. So I included this slide because we included it in our CURB presentation. I included it because I want to make the point, besides uh, giving an opportunity to, to answer any questions that might have come up so far, we didn't ask ourselves enough questions as we kept going. We, we kicked off really fast, really hot. The co-op did not actually exist at the time that we put in the grant application. And uh, asking questions is probably one of the biggest lessons learned that I, that I have to offer for you. So a few milestones. We made the presentation. Our project was affirmed by everybody because everybody understands how much sense it makes for local producers to be able to sell their food, their meat locally and be able to tell where it came from and cons for consumers to know that. All of that is very logical, very attractive. They offered us a loan, it had a match, and it had a deadline. So we were the, we were the dog that caught the car, and now we had to figure out what to do with it. We were at the starting line. And we jumped right in. We focused on the match that we needed. We, what we had at that point was we had a five-member ad hoc committee of an organization of ranchers. We didn't have a co-op. We had to form the co-op, and we couldn't start collecting money from people who wanted to support the project until we had the co-op formed. Forming the co-op took about six months, I think. Let's see. Yeah, it took about six months to get there, and we had to get an extension on our deadline because we didn't have the co-op formed in time. Um, we found another co-op to pattern ourselves after, and we jumped in and we used that as our, as our format because we figured they were already there, so we should be able to do that as well. And we focused on the structure of the co-op and the articles of incorporation, all the paperwork, but we didn't focus on creating the culture. And I can say that probably we should have done both. Um, our funding, when we stop and look at it now, but our funding profile in January of 2011 we were expecting to have the curb loan and then uh, the other about a quarter or so in private notes from investors and members. We set our membership fee really low. Uh, it was at $600. Um, we, figured we, we, we figured we could get those commitments of uh, investors, and it, didn't, it turned out to be actually relatively easy in some ways to, to attract investors. The business plan said it could happen with 100% debt funding. It, it showed us being able to reach profitability and in a time to be able to start repaying, even with 0% interest, repaying the, that, uh, that debt, that five years would give us enough time. What we lacked was monitoring to compare how what was happening matched up to the assumptions in the business plan in order to be able to stay on track. But we kept going. Uh, we started raising funds for the match. We hadn't fully realized the impact at the beginning that, that uh, curb funding was going to come with strings requiring us to bid work out under the state's prevailing wage rules. Uh, and contractors will tell you that prevailing wage adds 12 to 25% to the cost of projects. So we did the site design and uh, had the site work done before we had the building designed um, so that we could do it um, before we were actually had any paperwork had been signed with the state so that it was not a state project. It also meant, though, that we were doing, we were now doing this design in staggered pieces, and there's always a risk when you do that that it's not going to match up with what you eventually do design. You've, you've now layered another set of uh, restrictions on your final design. Um, so we did that. We got the site work done. 
And then we were able to use that site work as an in-kind match, valuing it at the way that it would have been valued under the state rules. Um, we had a plan for the design, started on the plant. And, and this is the area where I've actually spent my career. I've been a, an architect for over 30 years and done a lot of project management. I've only been a, a rancher since 2002. And I have to tell you, I've asked myself hundreds of times what we could have done better, what I could have done better to make this work. Um, but the best answer is that we needed to keep going back to what was that original plan so that we could review and see where, where we were making changes and assumptions that meant that we needed to change budgets, needed to change timelines, uh, needed to change expectations. So the first design came in. Um, we elected to do it under a design build format because that helped cut out several steps. We were kind of under a time crunch in order to get this underway as well. Uh, doing it as, as a design build, uh, instead of first contracting for the engineering and the design and then going out for bids on the construction, does cut out some steps. It doesn't always save money, but it does save time because you, you don't have as many steps in there, especially with the state's procurement processes, in order to get underway. So we put out a, a design build request for proposal. For the proposal we got back, remember we thought we were going to be building a 5,400 square foot plant. By the time we sat down and we wrote down what it was we needed in the plant, where we actually did the programming for the plant and determined what really needed to be in there, we came up with uh, the response was 7,600 square feet was the first design. And uh, we were over budget, obviously. So we did some paring down, got it down to just over 7,000 square feet. But we were still 30% larger than we had originally budgeted for. Again, that go back and, and see how did we get here and what do we need to do now. Well, our answer was always we're going to go get some more money. And we were able to do that because we still, we still do have a lot of people who are really rooting for this to work and who want it to work and have been willing to to be patient and, and uh, put in money to see that it's successful. And we really appreciate those backers and investors. We got construction started. Uh, by March of 2013, uh, we had, these were the milestones we had reached. We had all that core funding. We had a cooperative. We had a cooperative on paper. We hadn't built the cooperative culture with the people. We had bought the land. We had all that site work done. Uh, we had the design underway, and we were in the middle of constructing the plant, hiring key staff, scheduling ranchers, securing startup capital. Except for constructing the plant, those other three things were not things that we had anticipated. We thought we had enough money in our budget originally to give us startup capital, but we had used it to take care of issues that came up in the design and construction. That became our contingency. So we were... We were undercapitalized to start. This slide was used as part of a presentation seeking some additional uh, startup capital resources. Those other two points, the hiring key staff and the scheduling ranchers, those were pieces of the business plan that we had not spent a lot of time on. And we have a bunch of ranchers who are not, we're not human resources personnel. And um, probably one of the things that I would advise anybody going into this is that uh, is that you need to recognize where your weak spots are, and that was one of ours. We didn't have a, we didn't have a really excellent process for setting up for recruiting and training and re retaining staff and making sure that we had a good mix and that, that things were working well. When it came to scheduling ranchers, we didn't have a way. Uh, I know there's other co-ops that have had um, ways where they have actually kind of pinned their members down to, okay, you're going to bring this many animals on this day and that's your slot, and we didn't have that. Um, and that, so scheduling ranchers became an issue because we were totally um, set up to just wait for people to call us and not so much in going out and, and uh, finding them or in getting commitments to, so that someone would say, yes, I will be able to be there these days so that we could plan on the other side. But while all that was going on, we had construction, Everybody's excited about construction because now you, you see something tangible. And people who are drawn to production agriculture are people who like to see tangible results. So this was, the, this was really the most fun part. We really did get 
get to enjoy some of that. We had the equipment coming in. Uh, We had a plan for procuring the equipment. We were going to hire the manager and then have the manager who was going to understand and set up the processes within the plant be the one who put together the equipment package. Unfortunately, our first hire as manager took a job elsewhere about a week after he had committed to us, and we were left with no one in that position. So we, we put the equipment package together with the advice of an advisor from an equipment sales company, which which is okay. Um, the warning would be not, not that he was there, there was a problem of any kind of deliberate kind, but because the small-scale meat processing is such a new kind of um, project, uh, there are very few, if not any, in the last 30 years, um, and trying to be a, a plant that does sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle, so that we're multiple species, um, small-scale production, exactly how you run the processes really does make a difference in the equipment. And so the, the fellow who was helping us with the equipment, there were a lot of things that he didn't know he didn't know. But we got to August 2013, and we got to have a ribbon cutting, and we got to enjoy that. We were, we were underway. And this is the quote that comes back to me constantly. Donald Rumsfeld took a lot of flack for this, but he's absolutely right. There are things we don't know we don't know, and those are the ones that get you. So here's one thing we didn't, we didn't realize because it crept up on us. We had started out with the curb loan, which had those great terms of five years deferred payments, 0% interest, as three-fourths of our, um, our funding. We ended up with the curb loan being about 50% of our funding. Memberships were 2%, a very small buy-in by the membership, and that's a, that really should be a red flag for, for the co-op. The co-op itself needs to be, the members need to be more fully invested. 33% in private notes. A number of those are large private notes from co-op members, but then you have an imbalance between co-op members who have really heavily invested uh, and now have a very personal stake, and co-op members who, who, as one person put it, basically spent the price of a couple of snow tires uh, to be a member. Um, we had a line of credit that was at a fairly high interest rate that we had used for equipment at 8%. About a 5% at that point when I made this slide, we had a, a 5% line of credit we were using for operating, and we were still seeking about 2% in October of 2013 as we were going into our first winter. It's a very different picture from where we thought we were going to be when we started out. Now, I will say that we had the business plan reviewed by another expert um, who said, yeah, it, it made sense, it, it should work, but we didn't really do what I would call, that was just looking at the numbers. What we needed to do was to look a little bit more at the, how did those numbers compare to what we were actually, uh, we were actually finding ourselves at. The second lesson learned is in human resources, and um, you, you can see the pattern of that first year. The red in the bar graph, the red bars are the expenses and the green bars are the income. So it was on the right track. The income was rising. The expenses were, were st- uh, starting to stabilize, or at some point they are going to rise with, with income because it means you're processing more. The pie chart shows the green is the labor cost. So you can see where our major expense is at uh, 56% of the total is labor and that human resources piece. We didn't have anybody on our project team who had that expertise. I mean, I had some expertise uh, in capital facilities. Um, We have ranchers who had expertise in production and some in marketing, but we had nobody with expertise in human resources. The next three uh, highest expense categories combined add up to only 24%, and those were insurance, uh, which turned out to be a little higher than we had anticipated, um, interest expense because we had more private investor loans, some of which had required uh, us to be paying interest as we went, and utilities, uh, again, which ran a little higher than we had anticipated. 
Um, I think we didn't have a good model on what the cost of energy and uh, how much water we were going to be running through the plant. So the next lesson, area of lessons learned is on input. Uh, in order to ship meat out, animals need to come into the pens. And we didn't have a decent survey of members on their use until after we had actually started. And again, this is a piece of the business plan that we didn't fully develop. We fully developed the pieces that had to do with capital and operating expense projections, not so much on, uh, on the, uh, the input output. So we did some surveys. And I'm just going to run through these rather quickly. The blue in each case of each of these bar charts is the estimated number to be brought in. Red is the actuals. But when we did this survey, uh, even in uh, for 2013-2014, we were kind of, I don't think we emphasized, this has to be like for real in that year, we were really asking how much in... Um, how much in that year, but really, what do you, what's, what's your idea? What are you shooting for? We needed to be a little more, uh, bring that down a little bit more. But that was, that was goats. The big blue line is not me, by the way, because I didn't have time to be following up with that. Um, sheep, this was an interesting one because we actually had a, a non-member became our largest uh, customer for sheep. Swine, we had some expectations from a single producer that turned out to be not turned out to not come through. So again, that's that lesson about when you're if you are uh, projecting anything that's dependent on a single variable or a single source, you need to question that. This is the beef estimated and actual. Then you get to the throughput. So you have to have the animals come in, but you have to be able to put them through the plant. Um, the, the big dip there in January of 2014, again, we started in August after the first bar on the left, it's towards the end of August, very slowly, had a, a, a big October, November, dropping off in December as we get into the holidays and the roads get slicker. We had a shutdown in January of that first year of operation to re to fix a problem with the floors in the processing rooms. So that really cut uh, any kind of momentum we had, and we had to, re we had to restart again. Um, we had beef is the biggest number. We still had, uh, have a fairly consistent, uh, had a fairly consistent number of hogs in there, a little bit of Wagyu and beefalo. And we did have a producer who was doing a fair number of goats at that time. He had a good market. Um, he has dropped off, though, since then because distance to the plant has become an issue with a, with a very small, with the very small carcass. So this was our, our output and sales per cus by customer. You can see we have, we have one, um, one big customer who was doing everything he could to be bringing things through. And he had taken that, I'm going to use the cliche, bull by the horns, and had really worked on marketing, had picked up that middleman piece. and uh, But even with the expertise that he had in his own organization at marketing, because it's, uh, it's, it's Gebers Farms, and Gebers does a lot of fruit marketing, they've, so they've marketed perishable food products on large scale. Um, getting into the meat, Area was a was a different kind of area to get into, and so they had their own they they had their own learning curve with that. Um, because we did not have a marketing in place for the output, it was hard to attract the input because we had a lot of producers um, who who had the input but didn't have a way to market. So our current status. I was sort of shocked when we sent out our annual meeting notice. We've actually made it five years. Um, so we're still here. Uh, if you're a Monty Python fan, I, I keep saying that, uh, well, we're not quite dead yet. We're still hanging in there. We've had another reboot. Um, we, we changed our management operation from having the plant set up to be able to handle a full capacity load, but not knowing if that input was
coming in. In other words, we were carrying too high a level of staffing and uh, trying to be able to trying to have kill day. We rebooted to be have a little more flexible arrangement in how we were adapting, only doing kill days twice a week, really trying to uh, cut back to ramp up operations to match the demand. Um, we are making it. Oops. Lost sound. Meeting session is being recorded. Well, now I have no idea if she should keep talking or not, so I will just in case. You can keep going. I think the sound is back. The sound is back. Okay, so I, I did summarize the lessons learned, and it doesn't matter if you can't see the last slide because it's, it's a, a big slide that says we're still here, we're still writing our future, and we're stubborn. And uh, so here's the lessons learned summarized. The first one is undercapitalization. It's a classic startup challenge, and when you are undercapitalized, it limits your ability to respond to the other lessons that you don't know you're going to learn. Uh, cooperative development, uh, one of the things I think we've learned is that the, the importance of building the co-op before building the plant. We thought we could do it simultaneously, um, but the project sucks up all the oxygen and, and, and decisions have to come at you so quickly that you don't, you, you don't put the time into bringing all of the members along. Um, the capital facilities. It's hard to be first. We made lots of little mistakes. There are lots of little blind alleys. Uh, we, we needed to have a contingency in the budget for those things that we didn't know, we didn't know. We were overconfident in, in uh, the information that we had going in that looked like it knew it looked right but turned out to have problems. Uh, another lesson learned, distribution. Again, the middleman actually has a role to play and somebody has to play it. If you're not going to work with distributors, then you have to have a plan in place to do it yourself. At this point, we are, um, we're not ready to make a big announcement, but we have been cautiously building a relationship with a very large meat distributor who wants to be able to sell the story, wants to be able to say these are the ranches specifically that this meat is coming from, and, has, and that middleman has customers uh, who want that story as well. And uh, hopefully we will have, a, uh, we'll have a big announcement about that coming in the next month. But we're... We've learned not to jump too fast, and we're working on building that and building it with quality uh, right now. Um, timing is everything, and you can't always control your timing. We didn't know we were going to go from low cattle prices into phenomenally high cattle prices and the effect that was going to have on even our members' expectations. It's really hard to tell somebody, you need to bring this meat to the plant, you can sell it yourself, and you can make a little bit more when they can take those same cattle by the load and get a premium out of the packing plants because the prices are up for whatever reasons they are. Um, timing can relate to anything. What, what interest rates do, what the economy does, um, there, there will always be something that you didn't account for because you can't control all the uh, timing variables. And then the last one that I really want to emphasize is the human resources aspect. Um, skilled crafts are facing labor shortages nationally. I don't care where it is you're planning on building a plant. Unless they just closed down a large meat packing plant and you've got 100 employees to choose from, um, across all the skilled trades there are problems uh, in finding and, and retaining good people. Um, I really think that the apprenticeship program that, that originally connected me to Kapow, that that's a sound idea and something that we need to follow up on the chicken and egg thing. The jobs have to be there for people before they are going to be interested in, in putting their time in the apprenticeship. But somehow we need to get people back into skilled trades. In addition, we had a good idea that we were not able to carry through on. We really needed to have a strong general manager on board during plant design so that there was somebody who knew how a plant operated in intimate detail who could be providing better feedback to the uh, building designers and constructors on um, what what we needed at, at a at a uh, at a processing flow and at a detail level. Um, so if you are if you're looking to build a plant, make sure your co-op is built and strong first. Understand that you need some really good human resources expertise, and make sure you have enough money going in, and that you have really allowed a realistic amount for contingencies for construction and additional capitalization for startup. So with that, I'll uh, close and see if there's any questions. Um, Catherine, I can no longer see the, the chat screen, but if there are any questions, 
please feel free to just read them out loud. Sure, of course. And this is really great. I just posted a link on the HR info that you were discussing. I think there's a bit of an echo, but we'll carry forward. Um, I look like some questions are coming in right now, so please do uh, type your questions in the chat box as they come up. Um, I've got one as we're waiting. Uh, Sulani, you mentioned that you know at first you guys started out with a, a smaller design. I think it was about 5,200 square feet or so, and the the final plant design was around 7,000 square feet, about 30 percent larger. Do you feel like the final plant design you've ended up with has has been the right size, or do you feel like you're swimming around in this giant plant that you wish you still had a smaller plant? No, we wish we had a bigger plant. <laughs> I was wondering that because we often hear from folks wanting really small plants, and then once they're up and running, they want big plants, right? Or bigger. Um, and and one of the one of the drivers is that we have uh, we have a certain amount of storage for uh, for product after it's been processed, and uh, it's sized appropriately, but it depends on everything getting picked up very promptly. That doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. We do have a provision at the plant. Uh, we, we wired in a place where we could bring in a, uh, a modular refrigeration unit. We could add some additional refrigeration, but it would be at the expense of being able to easily use the loading dock and some other things. Um, there was another assumption that we made, which was that that um, we wouldn't have to, we didn't need to dry age carcasses as long, that we could use uh, loin aging. And so I'm not a meat. I, I don't I don't know how this all this stuff works. It's not my expertise. I have listened to this argument for the last three years over how long beef should hang before it's processed. Um, and there's those who want to cite all the science. There's those that say I don't care about the science. My customer thinks 21 days is better. Um, figuring out whose beef carcasses are hanging for how long becomes a traffic jam, unless you just have some more uh, some more space. So. Um, We've not been able to successfully use just the loin aging cooler that we had, and we finally have learned, we've learned with trial and error how to figure out where the optimum place is for, for aging and for getting animals in through processing, but um, cooler space is both on the input side and on the output side um, is, is an issue. The other thing, what we cut out of the 7,600 square foot plan was um, smoking and value added, and we probably regret that the most. That that would have that would have made a big difference in being able to attract more um, hog production. We've there's a couple of ways we work around that, but again, being it would have been much better to to be right there. Ah, that's interesting too. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, could you elaborate on the creation of the co-op? Would you go with the co-op model in hindsight? Um, in hindsight, in this situation, probably not, but only because now I know what it takes to really build a functioning co-op. Um, we probably would have been better off doing some kind of an, an LLC or an Inc. where we were offering investors uh, actual equity instead of taking on more debt load. But as a co-op, we can't offer investors equity. So um, I, I, I would, it's not that I wouldn't do it because a co-op is a bad ownership model for this kind of plant. I would do it because in this particular instance, I've now learned that the co-op needs to be an entity before it takes on a project. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm That's a really good point. Yeah, having that community and buy-in. Um, oh, I mean, a little bit of sound questions here. We'll give it a moment. Um, I've, I've got another one while we're, we're waiting for some of the other questions. I noticed, I'm going to see if I can click back to the slide. Some of the, on the member surveys, some of the producers that have the highest number of um, estimated animals that they would bring in, for example, we're looking at the B slide right now, ended up bringing in nothing. And I wonder if those were 
producers, particularly in beef, who were not marketing meat at all. They were, they were um, cow-calf operators used to selling feeder calves. And when you surveyed them with the possibility of the plant, they said, oh, yeah, I could bring in a lot of animals. Um, and then that didn't end up happening because of changes in the cattle market. you think that's a correct assumption, or was there something else going on? No, that, that's a correct assumption. Um, the, the prices in the cattle market had gone up, and we had, we, uh, again, we had a, a, there was another startup involved that was a startup to do distribution. Um, I, didn't, I didn't talk about that, but one of the producers was working with a, a group to start up a company that would, would be a distributor. But again, that was a startup as well, and they they had some issues. They had some struggles. Um, they've kind of rebooted as well and have come back. But there was there was a false expectation from some producers that they were going to be able to bring animals in, and somebody else was going to do that marketing for mm-hmm. them. And they didn't, they didn't quite get the concept. And that's that's a piece of that uh, communication that was that was lost because we didn't have a cooperative. Uh, infrastructure of, for communication uh, to regularly get information out and really make sure everybody understood the the decisions that the that the um, the leadership team the board was making. Uh, okay, okay, um, that's a very. Uh, oh, sorry, I was reading the comments on. Uh, it looks like you cut out right, right when you were answering about the co-op. So. Um, well, I could you want to just summarize that again. Yeah, thank you. So, so to Cynthia, because I now I've got the screen back again. Cynthia, oh, good. Um, what I said is that I, for this particular instance, uh, we we should have picked something other than a co-op because the co-op didn't already exist. Um, a, an existing co-op could take on a project. That's a different situation. We didn't have a co-op. Uh, we probably should have gone with an LLC or a corp so that we could have offered investors equity instead of just taking on so much debt load. So for those two reasons, uh, it would have reduced our, our debt load because we would have had people with equity and it would ha- uh, and, and because we just didn't have a co-op, co-op shouldn't take on a project before it exists. Mm-hmm. Looks like there's a question here from Arthur. Why did you move away from the original modular unit? Could the separation of the kill plant from the cut and wrap have worked? We moved away from the original modular unit because the company that was going to produce those modular units um, closed and because the curb funding required it to be bricks and mortar permanent construction. And they were a little uneasy with the idea that there was something that could be picked up and moved. Mm-hmm. And I also, I would just point out uh, from a NIMPAN perspective that it's pre- we've looked at plants like this and programs like this, and it's pretty hard to make a kill plant only work. There's just really not enough revenue in the slaughter fees. Right, and I, I didn't touch a lot on the numbers. I'm, I'm happy to share numbers with people if they're interested, but the one thing that has held constant from that original business plan was it projected that we needed to be at 15 to 20 head a day to, uh, to get to a... a a good level of profitability. We're still seeking to get to that level. Um, that still looks like the sweet spot. And um, the, the size of the plant, it probably should have been a little, a little bit larger. We, we skimped on, like I said, we took out the, the value-added piece. Well, we probably should have had the value-added piece. Um, we, we still struggle with the convincing people how long beef should hang, and we, have, we do have a, mostly a beef operation at this point. Um, it's been hard to incorporate the small animals on a regular basis. We're working on doing that on a specific day kind of basis uh, just because they, they take a lot of labor for a, for a small carcass. And so we're trying to figure out how do we keep the, the slaughter fees down for those so that it's actually profitable. That was the reason why the one goat producer um, isn't bringing in as many anymore. And it's frankly the reason we haven't started is because we're in the same position as the cattle prices where it's easier for us to sell to wholesale than, and not have to do our own marketing. Um, mm-hmm. So, I actually think that the plant is not bad. It needs to be just a little bit bigger, a little bit more elbow room in a couple places, and um, probably needed to be that 7,600 square feet. 
Yeah, to add in. And the, and the hog processing would allow you maybe to smooth out some of those um, seasonality issues. You can process hogs year-round. Um, right. But without the value be, added, not as attractive. Right. right. Without the value added, we kind of cut out that, that possibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know a little bit about the, you know, the background of this. Plant. Oh, here's another one coming in. We'll, we'll do the <laughs> audience questions first. Um, are you returning carcasses to co-op members, or are you cutting and packaging? Uh, sorry if I missed this earlier. Are we cutting, cutting, cutting and packaging? Again? Wondering if, if um, co-op members were picking up whole carcasses to have them cut and packaged somewhere else, but you guys do. No, we do the whole thing. We do the packaging, the labeling, the whole thing. Um, we're putting in place a, a system that will allow us to barcode every package to really improve the traceability. That's, a, that's part of the, the, the large uh, distributor that we're working with who wants to be able to do that, and that's going to that's gonna help improve our operations as well. Um, so we've always provided both. We do have some, uh, some producers who have picked up uh, sides, halves, and quarters. We've, we've had, um, if we can figure out how to make it work more efficiently, we have restaurants who want to get whole, uh, they want to, chefs who want to do their own breakdown, they want a whole uh, uh, lamb or, or goat carcass. Um, we'll, we'll do whatever we can that the, that the producer needs or that their customers need. Okay. And how much land is involved? How, what's the um, acreage on the, for the facility? We bought a five-acre parcel because that was the size of the parcel. We're using probably two and a half acres of it. Okay. And how about the current status of the um, apprenticeship idea? There's, uh, let's see, Cynthia says they're developing a poultry plant in South Central Idaho and need skilled employees. How much training money was there in your budget? We, you know, we didn't have we didn't have training in there because we were going to put out ads and we were going to attract all these great skilled employees that we didn't really think through where they were coming from. Um, the the idea of an apprenticeship program, our our uh, Lincoln County Economic Development Committee is still still has that idea on their on their uh, on their list, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point a, a another opportunity knocked and there was a way to get that started. Um, there is a culinary program at Spokane Community College that that uh, does have some um, some butchering and uh, processing sections to it. Um, that idea just it needs a champion to push it all the way through, and uh, I'm still pushing on the processing plant, so I can't take on the apprenticeship. But if somebody <laughs> wants to, it's the idea is all there. Well, and this is we've talked about this before. This is an interesting trade off of being in a um, kind of your distance from an urban area. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, many people do not want a meat processing plant in their backyard, um, so you tend to be in more these plants tend to be in more rural areas. Um, also, that puts you closer to your producer base. But being closer to an urban area gives you access to uh, perhaps a skilled employee base or even just access to more people total. I mean, there's more more potential employees to draw from. So there's one of those trade-offs. I think if you guys had been closer to Spokane or maybe in your original location, you'd be farther from your producers but closer to employees. Right. In the original location, that it wasn't as much of a concern. And again, that's one of those... Hey, we changed a variable. What else does this change? Okay, well, we changed our distance from Spokane, so it changes our, uh, you know, it didn't significantly change the number of producers available within a 200 square mile radius, but it did significantly change the number of employees within a reasonable commuting distance. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, and that and and that's an issue. Uh, we have a question here on how much of your capacity are you currently using? We're probably at. Uh, Let's see. I haven't, I haven't been down the last couple of weeks. We're probably at about um, a third to half of our capacity. We could, we could significantly, we could still significantly build. Um, but again, when we rebooted the plant, um, we didn't staff up assuming that we were going to be at capacity all the time. So we've, we've modeled it a little differently so we can absorb that and recognize that we're going to have to grow gradually. Um, if this, this, uh, this big contract comes through with the distributor, we get that relationship all smoothed out and, and, and running, um, we're actually going to have to deal with the, 
the staffing up issue. Um, but I think we'll be a little smarter about it this time, but, but I'm sure there's something else we don't know. <laughs> the, the unknown unknowns. Exactly. Uh, and, and what about poultry? Did you guys ever consider adding poultry to the plant? Uh, you know, it, it, it's come up a couple of times. It operates under different USDA rules. It's, in fact, it doesn't operate under USDA. I think it's, um, it's a different set of rules in a different agency, and they're, so it, we didn't for that reason. Yeah, it's, it's still um, USDA, FSIS, but poultry plants have a different inspection. You need an inspection legend, uh, sorry, an inspection bug for both. You'd, have, you'd be both a meat plant and a poultry plant, but you're right. It would definitely add additional complications. Right. It was, that, it, the reason was the complication of adding an additional set of, of rules. The HACCP, I didn't mention HACCP plans. We have, you know, we, we, um, we have a HACCP plan for our plant, and we've had employees who've gone through training. We'd really like to find some more training in the Northwest because we have some new employees we'd like to get hands-on. There is, there is the theoretical training on online, but uh, one comment I'll, I'll say is that somebody who is really good at the tangible, hands-on kind of skilled craft work is not necessarily the same person who can learn effectively off of a computer. Mm -hmm. um, Very good point. So we have a, we have one. In fact, we have one really good employee right now. He's he's struggling to get through it. He'll get through it, and he will technically have finished. But you know, we've talked about it, and he admits it's just it's not the way that he learns very well. He's not. He doesn't feel like he's going to retain it very well. Yeah, versus having an in-person training and right. Um, another thing I noticed, and maybe I can click to the slide while we're talking, is uh, you'll have lots of very small customers. Um, here we go. So total sales mm -hmm. through September 2014. And I'm just thinking of the transactional costs of um, working with some of the very small processing customers versus some of your larger customers. You, you know, it, there's a trade-off. If you only had a, a right. handful of very large customers, your business would be very dependent on them. But small customers come with transactional costs as well. Right. And that, on that slide, on that top bar that's so long, it has the red star. The, what that red star says is that that represents... 191 customers under $2,500 in a year of business. Mm -hmm. um, and only 15% of those small customers are members. No, the majority of our, our of the users of the plant are are not members. We we have a we have a really lopsided um, in terms of numbers, not in terms of volume, because our largest uh, the largest one is a member, but um, mm -hmm. but. Again, that's part of that. We didn't build, a, we didn't have a co-op operating before we started the plant. That's a very good point. Um, a question here about your potential new distributor: Will they be selling to restaurants and in institutions, or um, to retailers who would need consistent case programs, and uh, meaning uh, cases of the same cuts of meat over right. and over? Right, it's to restaurants and institutions, and to specific retailers who recognize the value of the uh, local regional traceable label and who would take it on as a, a specialty. Oh, good. That will help with carcass management and balance. Right. I mean, we've learned that we can't do that kind of program. We just, we can't, we're not, we're never going to be able to do that kind of program. We have to make sure that we can sell the whole animal and we have to know how we're going to do that. Yeah, that's that's very important for the for smaller scale plants and um, and and small scale marketing programs as well. Um, Looks like we've uh, the, like, the Gebers mm -hmm. Farms has actually uh, found a, a way to deal with some of that just even before we're getting into this other plan. But uh, they've uh, they've found an, a, an old storefront up in uh, Brewster, and they have uh, they've taken advantage of this opportunity for kids coming back to the ranch. One of the one of the third generation um, is running the cattle operation, and and she sells a whole bunch of cuts there that would probably not sell in an, in an ordinary retail location. But they have a population in Brewster that has a lot of folks who still have recipes for um, for kidney and heart and and cuts that um, that don't make it into typical American uh, retail establishments. Oh, that's great. That's a great idea. So, so they've found, they have found a niche, niche market in their <laughs> area uh, because of the large um, 
recent immigrant population that still remembers how to cook the whole cow, the whole, the whole cow. Yeah, find, finding the, the right market for the right cut is very important. Um, well, there's a few, a few more questions coming in. We're going to wrap it up here in just a few. We're, we're past, um, a little bit past our time. There's, well, we'll do one more here. Um, are the animals coming into your facility, are they, you know, natural, organic, grass-fed, um, other special label production methods, or is all types? Is conventional uh, all well? types. We're, we are, we, we are uh, raising, we're agnostic when it comes to the method they're raised by. We just want to make sure that the producer gets theirs back and that they can tell their own story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then one more, uh, we'll have this be our last question here today. What are your thoughts on the total cost needed for a startup facility? <laughs> um, That's a big one. Uh, yeah, Arthur, I, I actually, I'd be happy to go back and look uh, and, and come up with a real number, but my first, an- my first response was about 20% more than you thought it would. <laughs> um, but I, I, um, I haven't had a chance to take a breath and actually put together kind of the financial case study I've actually considered going back to that same Whitworth MBA class and saying, okay, would, would somebody want to come and do like a, a retrospective um, with the numbers? And I realized that would be really useful to people. So I'm, I'm not trying to be flipped, but I, I, don't, I, didn't, I haven't done that. Yeah, that actually would be great to see here, here's what we planned and here's the actual. Um, well, thank you so much, Sulani. I really appreciate it. This has, has been very informative. I, I hope it has been for me and I hope.